Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to um, your week 12, I think, lectures. No, week week 13. That's right, week 13 <laughs> lectures. Who's counting? Um, nevertheless, this means that um, with each lecture, we are getting closer and closer to your finish line. So congratulations, you're almost there, um, but not before you learn about... The World War II and actually first the rise of totalitarian regimes, then World War II, or how will the rise of totalitarianism uh, give way to the World War II, and then um, as far as the time permits, also you shall learn about um, the coming of the war of the Cold War as well as yeah in the aftermath of the World War II. <laughs> so I just foreshadowed the entire um end of semester for you uh and we will start as usual by reminding ourselves that last week during the lecture we spoke about various things troubling europe between 1819 and uh, 1930 um and we have observed it have observed this period um as a part of this new cultural, intellectual, and also scientific um, age, uh, the so-called modern age, uh, within and when we studied this period during the or in, within the context of the age of anxiety, and we've also seen how, as a consequence of the World War Two, World War World War One, um, women had also uh, gained the right to vote by 1920s. Um, and so we can kind of uh, still apply the same label in terms of anxiety to the following decades, actually, um, of 1920s and 1930s, when we will start to see the rise of the totalitarian regimes. Uh, and, you know, during the age of anxiety, between and also between the two world wars, it will be the communist dictators and also fascist dictators uh, who will become increasingly popular. And when I say communist, we mean far left of the spectrum of ideology, like political ideology. And when I say uh, a fascist, I mean far right on the scale of political ideologies, right? And we actually must understand the or the rise of these extremist dictator, dictatorial regimes um, with the times of crisis, because as we shall learn this week, um, there are, there's going to be a numerous uh, financial crisis of the one started by the series of Great Depressions in Europe, particularly in Germany, as well as the political crisis um, associated with uh, the immediate aftermath of the World War I, in which, according to the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Germany will kind of become increasingly angry at the terms of the treaty. And those things creating this um, atmosphere of unrest an atmosphere of dissatisfaction uh, in some places in Europe, predominantly in Italy and Germany, that will create a path to the rise of political extremism. Okay, so crisis usually breeds rise of extremist regimes. Um, and it's always during the times of crisis that very radical, very totalitarian, in this case, uh, regimes will come to power. And so totalitarian is kind of like the word uh, or the main word for this week. And I will explain to you in just a second what exactly it means. But both the radical left, meaning the Communist Party, predominantly in Russia with Stalin, as we've seen uh, uh, partially last week, uh, and then the radical right with Hitler and Benito Mussolini being the representatives um, will start to represent challenges to all of these years of progress that have been made in Europe um, in late 19th and early 20th century. So think about you know things like the expansion of the right to vote, 
Think of the things like, you know, expansion of liberties, individual liberties, protection of speech, protection of peaceful assembly, uh, protection of, you know, again, just people, you know, the workers having more rights than ever before as were given to them in the late 19th century. All of these things will start to uh, slowly regress and being taken away from people um, in the aftermath of the World War One. By the way, on the picture, on the slide, if you are wondering, this guy right here, Benito Mussolini, this guy right here, you know him already, Adolf Hitler probably, representing the fascist regime. And of course, you might be familiar with the face of Joseph Stalin, whom we spoke about um, last week when we um, discussed the Russian Revolution and rise of communism in Russian state. So we've already, that said, kind of discussed um, some characteristics of Stalin's regime. And today, we, in this week, we will actually uh, kind of briefly discuss Stalin in further length too. But more predominantly, we will focus this week uh, within the context of totalitarianism on the regimes of uh, Benito Mussolini first, and then also secondly, uh, towards the end of this week, Adolf Hitler as well. But before, do any, before we do any of that, we are going to first define what does it mean to be a totalitarian dictator or totalitarian ruler. And to describe a regime as a totalitarian, um, either either communist or fascist, um, we are describing a system in which the rulers are kind of seeking to ex exercise quote unquote total claims, uh, including uh, total claims including things like you know people's beliefs, uh, people's thoughts, people's behavior. Um, and also, while doing this, taking the absolute control of economic, of social, intellectual, cultural life of uh, people. So you're controlling all aspects of society. So one dictator, one person controls human life, period. And firstly, they kind of uh, dominate the political and legal system because they, again, have the absolute control to actually make laws um, and also control armies. And because they are making laws, they are no longer relying on um, any fragments of the parliament or even be interested in uh, allowing the parliament to participate in you know, lawmaking or having any debates or balance of power with different parties because they are literally non-existent, okay? So it's control of ideology, meaning there's only one party, literally, to vote for in the elections, if there even are elections, right? And then on top of that, and what's quite specific about totalitarian regimes, compare as to if we were to compare them with say you know french absolutism that we are familiar we were familiar with from the beginning of the semester what's unique about totalitarian regimes is that um they the, the rulers will actually actively seek to directly influence public opinion so they will engage in in this control of thought um, in any way possible. We might colloquially call it actually, you know, brainwashing if, if you want to use a layperson's language, right? Um, and they would use means of deception, spreading lies, spreading conspiracy theories, um, and representing those things as facts, and concealing perhaps the level of atrocities committed uh, to people um, uh, through state-sponsored propaganda, okay? So they are essentially imposing certain kind of values as true and as desirable in specific society. Now, you might ask, well, you know, how is that even possible? How can you control the thoughts and, you know, thought processes of people? I, you know, we might, you know, look at this and say, oh, I would never let this happen to me. I would be clear-minded enough and I would use my brains enough not to ever be fooled to be swayed by thoughts of these dictators, right? That's easy to say because um, the, the the methods 
with which um, these dictators would uh, ensure obedience um, are few. First of which is that they will have to complete and total control of the use of violence and use of intimidation. That, for example, can be the establishment of forced, la forced labor camps. We've seen how that has played out with Stalin and his establishment of gulags or these Russian, Siberian uh, forced labor camps that he will establish in 1930s. And we will also see uh, later this week how Hitler, too, will establish his own forced labor camps, right? Um, and... For example, we've seen with gulags, um, which were put in place, put in motion under Stalin from 1930s through 1955, there will be millions of those who were allegedly disrespecting the Stalinist regime, uh, who were then sent deliberately uh, to forced labor camps, often without proof of any evidence or proof of any wrongdoing. It was a literal witchcraft in which all you had to do is, you know, accuse someone of something in order to be released from your sentence. Um, and it's kind of like it was a snowball effect in which everybody and their moms was accused of being the enemy of the state. Um, and also, a very important uh, portion of how to secure ob obedience and how is it possible that, you know, we do see the rise of totalitarian regimes and people trying to be listening to the dictators will also be through uh, the organized efforts of state-sponsored propaganda. So state-controlled propaganda is a very important um, uh, component of totalitarian regimes, uh, both in communist and fascist states. Um, and they will try to engage in mass media and propaganda campaigns to advance their goals. There is a second example that comes to us also from Soviet Russia. And in this propaganda poster, titled, quote, The Great Stalin is the banner of friendship between peoples of the USSR, right? So in it, we see Stalin, Soviet dictator, receiving flowers from constituents who are seemingly happy, overjoyed with his presence, um, beloved, like uh, creating or conjuring this image that Stalin is indeed a beloved, respected ruler, um, even though the truth is he sends people to gulags by hundreds of thousands, and he also is starving Ukrainians by millions, Ukrainian gulags, uh, and Ukrainian uh, famine genocide, if you remember the lecture from last week, right? So this is an example of Stalin, but as we shall see, um, Hitler will also... Uh, engage in his own respective propaganda program. Another way in which communists and fascist dictators will maintain their power and will maintain their control in all aspects of human life will be through the rejection of all individualism. And in fact, as you will read uh, a tract by Benito Mussolini, you will see the reasons why, uh, or he will list the reasons why individualism or enforcing individual rights and liberties is actually a very bad idea uh, that disjoints the unity of the nation, okay? And in fact, if you remember our discussion of ideologies a few weeks back, uh, you will see that rejection of individualism has to do with ideology of nationalism, okay? So we can kind of think of um, uh, fascist regime in particular, or fascism as a type of totalitarian regime, as being extremely nationalistic, na nationalistic in that it kind of rejects um, these premises of classic liberalism, and then this will also be true of communism, actually, as well, in that they, the, the rulers will want to limit the power of individuals, or they will try to limit the responsibility of the state to actually protect rights of individuals. 
And so uh, uh, totalitarians, both communist and fascist, actually believed that if we allow people to have individual freedoms, including freedom of speech, freedom to organize political parties, freedom of religion, freedom of like, or me, by that meaning freedom of all religions, not just one, freedom of assembly, like peacefully gathering, uh, even protesting, criticizing the government, all of these um, are representing the damage to the nation's unity in the eyes of totalitarian regimes, right? And so instead, they argued there should be only one party in the state to reinforce this idea of uh, hyper homogeneity or hyper let's all think alike, um, uh, let's all be the same. Um, and then one party, one political party must work to ensure that all people think alike, all people have the same opinions, meaning that this ruler is the best thing since the sliced bread. And also uh, that these notions of unity are actually providing us with sense of uh, conjured collective harmony, right? So both fascism and communism will reject individual rights, will reject individual freedoms, and indeed reject parliamentary government or a system in which people go out to vote for various political parties to represent them in the parliament, instead favoring then just one party and one party system. Now, when you look at these three, think of these three as one, two, three, terror, control propaganda, and rejection of individual rights. Think of these three as ways in which all totalitarian regimes are alike. So this is the way in which they are similar. This is the way in which both fascism and communism are indeed similar. Now, let's discuss ways in which they are different to even further understand uh, what we mean by, you know, these different totalitarian regimes, right? First, uh, we, we will focus on uh, ways in which totalitarian regimes are different when it comes to uh, class versus the nation debate. Um, and in fact, uh, all communist regimes, you probably remember from reading Communist Manifesto, uh, will be interested in creating this, you know, international solidarity, this international brotherhood of workers, um, that can be achieved only if uh, we kind of eliminate all differences of income, okay? And so communists, particularly Stalin, too, will be concerned with the uh, erasure of this idea that there are different social classes. And Instead, they will argue that classes should not exist. So the entire world internationally should be a classless society. And that's what, that was exactly what Stalin was working towards once he came to power. Um, and in fact, uh, the example we provided uh, that kind of told us how will the Stalinist regime uh, work to destroy the classes and to attempt everybody to be equal in terms of, you know, social, in, in terms of, you know, wealth equality, he will install his five-year plan. Um, and if you remember, he will argue that by nationalizing private property, particularly by nationalizing uh, farmers' lands, by the state confiscating the lands of the peasants, um, uh, we will enforce um, industrialization of a USSR, right? Now, the fascist vision of society was actually quite different, and it had less to do with the class system or less to do with creating classless society and more to do with the this notion of national identity. And fascist leaders such as Mussolini and Hitler they did not worry as much about, you know, ensuring or providing equality of income for everyone or making everybody like, you know, the working class, right? So fascism is not about the class struggle. Fascism is about the struggle of the nation to become the best 
and the greatest, right? In fact, when you think of fascism, think of nationalism, but on steroids. And, and fashion, uh, fascism is this ideology of almost extreme militaristic style nationalism in which we have this excessively high levels of love and admiration for one country, which can be fine and beautiful, but if you twist it to include hatred for everybody else, then it's a problem, right? So this is, you know, the, the essence of fascism is to love one country, love one nas- nation state, and hate literally everybody else. And the fascist leaders will claim that, you know, individual freedoms are not necessary, Uh, You don't need, for instance, freedom of religion, freedom of worship, freedom of speech, um, because all people need is to love the nation. And actually, love for the nation will kind of be, you know, liberating, you know, liberating enough, right? Um, And fascist dictators are those who are able to convince people that they should prioritize this worship of the nation over the worship of everything else. Now, did that necessarily mean we should abandon religion? Um, Certainly in the case of Germany, yes, probably. Uh, Also in case of, honestly, in case of um, the communist regimes as well. Uh, If you read uh, Stalin's actually not Stalin's, um, the, the Communist Manifesto, towards the end of it, um, uh, Marx provides arguments as to why religion can be distracting uh, for organizing the workers' revolution, right? Um, you will read Mussolini. He kind of had similar, he kind of had actually different uh, visions of uh, religion, and he actually kind of helped thought that, you know, Roman Catholicism could actually aid uh, the span or the, the the popularity of nationalism. So in terms of religion, there were kind of, you know, differing opinions. But nevertheless, in each case, love for the nation trumps necessity for spirituality and religious service, okay? And particularly that goes in fascism because, you know, fascists are about creating one nation state. Um, and so, again, it's not the class, for fascists, it's, it is not the class that unifies the nation. It's actually love uh, for the nation that unifies people inside of the borders of a particular country. And this ideal fascist state, uh, in it, all social, all social classes, everybody, regardless of middle class, working class, the wealthy class, they all kind of are working together to build harmonious national community that is superior to other nations. Now, communists and fascists differed um, in another crucial way, and that is their uh, relation to the notion of race uh, or the question of race in general. Because on one hand, uh, communists were looking to build a new world based on uh, the destruction of class differences and not so worried about distinctions between the races, the races, okay? But fascists were quite different when it comes to uh, race and racial theory because fascists typically sought to build a new national community grounded in racial homogeneity or ensuring their racial purity uh, or kind of insisting that in order for a nation to look the most perfect, we must have only one race. And they will argue very dangerously um, that the nation is as good only as it's not only uh, if it's racially pure, okay? It's only as good as it's racially pure. And to kind of accomplish this goal of racial purity, fascists will embrace the doctrine or the practice of eugenics. A simple way to explain eugenics is to say that it is a practice of selective breeding that will be emerging because of the popular, uh, because of popularity 
of ideas of social Darwinism in Europe in early 20th century. And we know exactly what social Darwinism means already, right? It is this, in eugenics too, will become this pseudoscientific doctrine saying that um, only certain kind of people are desirable and only certain kind of people actually have the right to procreate, to multiply. And that this selective reading, eugenics, selective reading, can actually improve uh, the general characteristics of national population. Remember, the goal of fascists is to create a perfect nation that's racially homogenous. Well, we do that by controlling who uh, has sexual intercourse, and we do that by controlling, um, you know, uh, you know, just making sure that you know only the right in in the eyes of fascists, the right kinds of people are uh, popular are are multiplying, if you will. Uh, and in the eyes of the fascists, again, to make the nation the best and the strongest, nation ne nation needs to encourage sexual intercourse only between the best kinds of humans. And we can actually see how this pseudoscience, the, the fake science, that's what I mean by pseudo, it's just kind of problematic and even fake, um, it has roots in social Darwinism in as much that, you know, eugenics embraces the idea that only the strongest people, the fittest people, uh, the white people, uh, the Aryan race, meaning Northern and Germanic Europeans, need to survive. And everybody else, we can just get rid of them because they are not promoting, they are not helping us making this nation great. Um, the example of uh, eugenics will be extremely uh, popular, or the practice of eugenics will ex be extremely popular in Nazi Germany. And Nazis actually maintained that there is a difference between the impure and pure races, and they believe that the nation needs to get rid of the impure or the undesirable race. And you already probably know uh, that fascists in Germany predominantly targeted the Jewish community. But others whom fascists will deem as quote-unquote undesirable and impure were also the group known as Roma, uh, and they are often referred to in a derogatory term as Roma gypsies, um, but also other ethnic uh, minorities were targets. Uh, on top of that, also people who identified with the LGBTQ plus community were the targets or were quote unquote impure, as well as people suffering from mental illnesses or people with disabilities are also representing this burden on the state and making the state less perfect. Hence, we need to get rid of them, right? And part of the eugenics program was distributing propaganda regarding this undesirable uh, races, such as the one, uh, this one right here with the guy, uh, uh, kind of uh, sharing um, this burden of carrying on his shoulders, quote unquote, the undesirables, right? Uh, and this, uh, what you see written on this poster, translates from German as, quote, you are sharing the load. A hereditary ill persons cost 500,000 German marks on average up to the age of 60. So those who are, um, you know, quote unquote, hereditary ill persons um, are actually representing the burden on German taxpayers and we need to get rid of them. And we should too get rid of uh, this person with uh, a face that doesn't even look human representing uh, every race that perhaps is not pure white. And all of these, you know, you see this white dude strongly carrying him on his shoulders, kind of invoking the same images and the same messages that uh, the Kipling's poem, The White Men's Burden, was also trying to show us in the age of social Darwinism and in the age of new imperialism. So these images of racial purity will continue to be amplified throughout 1920s and 1930s Germany. 
Uh, and another part of eugenics was the effort of German scientists who were commissioned by German government in 1930s in particular uh, to literally walk around and to measure people's facial characteristics to either deem them fit or unfit in the society. And on the second photo, this black and white photo, you see a German racial anthropologist who will work for the project in Nazi Germany to research the archaeological and cultural history of this Aryan race, of this pure, what they thought is the pure white race of Northern and Germanic peoples. And in this image taken in 1938, the anthropologist is actually measuring the woman's head and woman's nose to demonstrate what, you know, German Nazi system and, you know, German scientists at the time believed that there are the quote unquote inferior uh, characteristics of their race. So if your nose doesn't fall into particular measurements of, you know, white, white person's nose, then you are deemed impure and unnecessary. Some quite sick stuff. Okay. Now that we know what fascism is, what totalitarianism is, um, we can start by looking at some examples that are not related to um, communism, but are rather related to fascism in particular. So uh, because we already discussed, you know, Stalin, for the rest of this week, we're going to focus on um, the rise of fascism in Europe instead. We will start with Mussolini because he was the first fascist ruler in Europe. Mussolini and his supporters will be the first to declare themselves as fascist and give it the name, this ideology, a name, the fascism. And they will define it as ideology whose goal was to create this um, totalitarian state uh, based on extreme nationalism and based on extreme militarism. To make sure how uh, Italy got there, uh, let's briefly remind ourselves that um, last time we spoke of Italy, we mentioned that following the event of Italian uh, unification in 1870s, the state will now turn to be called the Kingdom of Italy. And it was a state that was kind of like half and half, half uh, with one foot still in the old system, meaning the monarchy, and with the other foot still in this, or, or entering this new system of democracy in which a handful of people are actually electing representatives to the parliament. But nevertheless, in late 19th century, people, uh, only people who owned the property could vote. Um, and that said, there was a still wide gap between, you know, the wealthy, the progressive, the industrial North Italy. And to oppose that, there was this uh, stagnant agrarian peasant populated South of Italy. Uh, and we can say that even on paper, Italy was unified. In actuality, there were still two different Italys, right? Um, and Mussolini... He has been politically active since, uh, you know, 1870, since the moment of Italian unification. And he was actually not very fond of this new system, this half democracy, half monarchy. And in early 1900s, he said that the only way that Italy could truly unify is if we potentially abandon all of these democratic parts of the system and also abandon monarchical system as well and instead come up with something new, something brand different. And he thought that, you know, Italy needs an ideology that um, at least on the paper and through words would actually help little people or, you know, the commoners uh, whom he called, you know, the desirables and that, you know, they would work that these common folk would actually work against the quote unquote established interests and quote unquote established politicians. Okay. So it's like a very populist centered, like people, common person centered ideology. 
And he said that, you know, uh, people have been sitting in their positions of power in Italy for decades, and they got to their positions of power not based on merit, but based on systems of monarchical privileges, and that is simply not correct. Which is why he will, in 1921, organize a new party, and he will call it the National Fascist Party. Now, the origins of fascist come from the Italian word fascio, which means or has historically been meant uh, this bundle of wooden sticks that you kind of see displayed right here. This was the uh, official flag of uh, the Italian fascist party. And in it, we see this fascio, this uh, a collection of wooden sticks that historically... Uh, has been carried by or carried around by ancient Roman statespeople during the, uh, you know, Italians' age of fame and fortune and glory, during the, Itali dur during the Roman Empire, well, Roman Republic first, and then also Roman Empire, right? And he will kind of take this symbol of fascio um, as uh, this bundle, uh, and he will take it uh, to kind of symbolize this collective ruling power. Okay, so he will say, "Well, I might be fa I may be fascist, but other people agree with me too. This is a collective decision." Okay, and in Mussolini in, in 1922, Mussolini and his bundle of fascists will literally uh, march onto the city of Rome. And they will threaten the current king, and they will literally kind of force him, push him, to appoint Mussolini as the prime minister of Italy. And the threat will actually work because, you know, the Italian king was likewise very not much in favor of democratic rule, and he allowed Mussolini to, he will single-handedly allow Mussolini to take over the government. Um, and so pretty much, if you think about it, Mussolini came to power legitimately by simply showing up at the king's doorstep with a few of his supporters saying, we are here and we wish to claim the power. And King said, you know, you know what? I was already thinking about that already. I was already thinking about someone else coming over, someone more stringent, someone more strong-handed um, that should lead the country instead because these liberal Democrats, all they want is to give the power to the hands of the common people. They want to expand the people's right to vote. And, and you know, we simply cannot have this. That was the King's logic, right? And so Mussolini will seize this opportunity of King's, um, you know, agreements with democratic system, and he will come to power as the prime minister entirely through legal means. And by the end of the decade, Italy was one party dictatorship under Mussolini's unquestioned leadership. Okay, so there was no bloodshed, no revolution. This, this radical regime came to be entirely legitimately. Now, what was Mussolini like as a totalitarian ruler? Well, firstly, we have learned that uh, the key aspect of one being totalitarian ruler is to first seize the political power or take over the government. He did that, so check on that. Um, and from then, you have to proceed to convince people uh, that the elimination of individual liberties and civil liberties is actually good for them by brainwashing them through state-sponsored propaganda and through intimidation, right? So that's like, you know, your path to totalitarianism. And Mussolini will deliver in this respect as well, because the fascist state, since Mussolini was in power in 1920s, he will engineer, uh, create a popular support by, among other things, staging the massive rallies and establishing the massive youth organizations to instill you these values of national unity. Like we all agree with this system. It's the best thing, right? 
Um, and this is an example, right? This uh, black and white image is an example of one of these rallies, the so-called fascist youth parade. And in fact, uh, all totalitarian regimes will um, mobilize the young people uh, to join all of these, you know, organizations for promotion of youth and unity uh, to conjure this image that, you know, this 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 regime is actually popular, right? And in it, in this picture, in this instance in particular, we see young military people kind of celebrating the nation uh, with them raising their rifles and saluting um, at the mass rally, kind of showcasing the support for the fascist dictator. And the state's control of the newspapers and radio will also produce similar effects, trying to convince people that, you know, this new regime is actually good for people. Uh, and Mussolini will promote the new cult, uh, the cult of the leader, or the cult of il duce. Il duce or duce is like the word in Italian for leader. And this, you know, poster you see to the right of your screen uh, is portraying Mussolini as this powerful statesperson, kind of having, you know, statue, uh, like a, a posing uh, and, and kind of uh, almost like a Superman looking uh, pose, um, embodying the qualities of Italian people. And so that's to say that Mussolini will also kind of gain support from Italians by manipulating this image of popular pride and appropriating actually symbols of the grand history uh, in the ancient or since the ancient Roman Empire. So they were kind of Italians under Mussolini were actually kind of flirting with this idea that under Mussolini as its leader, Italy will actually achieve the equal prestige that the Roman Empire and Roman Republic in ancient history once had. Because if you've ever taken 101, History 101, you've learned how uh, Europe basically was the Roman Empire. There was no Italy, France, Germany. No, this all of this was Italian, it was Roman property, property of the Roman Empire. And here he is conjuring these or, or, or mobilizing, ap appropriating these historic images, invoking the old times of Roman fame, um, saying that he can make uh, Italy uh, as prosperous, as glorious as it once was when it was a uh, Roman empire. Okay. Um, okay. So creating this cult of personality was something that all totalitarian regimes and leaders shared. Uh, so both Mussol uh, all three, Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler, uh, will have these images constructed to bolster their popularity and to calcify their regimes. Um, lastly, another very important feature of the fascist leaders, Mussolini in particular, uh, and at the moment, but later also Hitler, will be this desire or belief that territorial conquest and military expansion action are actually important part of totalitarian rule. Uh, so we must showcase to everyone uh, of this one nation's greatness and support legitimacy for fascist regime by conquering or by acquiring more territory for ourselves. And actually, before I flip the side, please remember that this is actually going to be another way in which, you know, the fascist regimes are in fact different from communism or communist totalitarian regimes. Um, because communists will be actually less interested in any territorial or military expansion. Because remember, Stalin's regime, for, for the most part at least, um, like we said, will focus on this idea of socialism in one country. Uh, so they were not interested in expanding uh, the borders of the Soviet Union, or, for instance, to colonize uh, the world. And, and in fact, 
uh, communists, for all their foes, have actually always been against imperialism. So communism, in its essence, it's anti-imperialistic ideology. We do not need to worry about, you know, conquering overseas territories. All we need to worry about is organizing the workers' solidarity and organizing the workers' revolution that's going to eliminate the class and it's going to create classless society. Fascism, quite different, because fascists will be uh, obsessed with military and t uh, with territorial conquest. Uh, this will definitely become true of Hitler, uh, and it will be one of the reasons why the World War II will start. Um, but in terms of Mussolini, because we are studying the example of Mussolini now, um, we have to remember that in the context of Italian fascism, uh, he was very uh, territory hungry, hungry for land. And in fact, in um, 1830s, Italian armies will start to invade uh, the African nation of Ethiopia in October of 1935, to be more precise. And this event will be known as the so-called Second Italo-Ethiopian War, in which Italy will seek to colonize uh, this territory in uh, what's called the Horn of Africa, in the eastern portions of African uh, continent, particularly the country of Ethiopia. In fact, the reason why it's called Second Italo-Ethiopian War is because uh, a few few decades earlier, Italians during the uh, or following the scramble for Africa, this new imperialistic tendencies of Europe in the late 19th century, Italians, if you remember me mentioning briefly, will actually fail to uh, secure any of the colonial possessions in um uh, in Africa. And so they will actually feel, Italians will feel kind of embarrassed because almost all European countries will have their colonial possessions in Africa, but Italians were defeated by army of Ethiopians. This time, Mussolini uh, will say that, you know, this defeat was embarrassment for Italians. So I'm going to construct a new war in which we will actually prove ourselves uh, and fix this failure of Italians a few decades earlier, okay? And so at uh, this time, unfortunately, for Ethiopia, Ethiopian army was not as well equipped as Italians, and it was actually a very easy victory for Italians. And Ethiopia was defeated, um, it was annexed, and it, was, it became a subject to um, Italian military occupation. Okay, so this Italian occupation of Ethiopia kind of fulfills this requirement on Mussolini's part to not only redeem Italy for its failures during the partition of Africa a few decades earlier, but to also showcase to the rest of the countries that, you know, if you, uh, that Italy is strong, first and foremost, but also in order for uh, a fascist ruler to be strong and to, to appear strong and to appear popular, he must expand territorially. And so this will also become a hallmark, territorial expansion will from then become a hallmark of fascist um, system as well. All right, um, although both Mussolini and uh, Stalin ruled very ruthlessly, as we just seen, and employed questionable methods to keep them in power, as we've just seen. They passed policies damaging uh, the society and individuals' rights and liberties. Perhaps the most frightening um, and the most atrocious dictatorship, the scariest kind of totalitarianism and fascism, will actually develop in Nazi Germany. And in order to understand Hitler's rise to power, we must first understand that, you know, the immediate aftermath of World War I in Europe uh, was not very favorable towards Germany. Because just three years after uh, the peace treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, this, you know, treaty that, you know, is supposed to end all the wars, 
uh, Europe was actually uh, planting the seeds for the future conflict because the treaty really was set up to very harshly punish Germany for Germany's wrongdoing during the World War I. And remember that the Treaty of Versailles will strip Germany of her army. Um, they were ordered to downsize their marine, their air force, and their military, their army. Um, and they established this territory of Rhineland, essentially a German territory, uh, to become this buffer zone, this demilitarized zone between France and Germany. And also, most radically, perhaps for Germany, the Article 231, uh, the so-called war guilt cause, will actually blame Germany uh, for the war, for causing the war. And German government was supposed to pay $33 billion in war reparations to the Allied powers. And for that reason, you know, Germany kind of sort of starts off tw uh, 1920s in a tremendous war debt. And so what does German government start to do? Well, a tactic that seems very easy, uh, but it never works. Uh, in fact, Germany will start to print paper money. They will start to print German marks to to in order to get these $33 billion that they didn't have in the first place, right? But what's the problem with printing more money than you have or printing more money than that you did not have to begin with, right? This is a, a, a economics 101. Uh, this will actually spearhead a, ramp a, a ramp rampant inflation. So the money itself actually will start to lose its value once you start printing more money. Um, and in fact, by 1924, German mark, the official state currency, will lose its value overnight, and Germany will enter a stage of hard economic depression. And in fact, as you see on the pictures, uh, Germans were jokingly, perhaps, beginning to call the German mark, the German currency, the wallpaper money, as you see this gentleman on the right kind of using it uh, to to instead decorate his walls with it because he could if he could find no other use for the money that now has lost its value, uh, and also the worthless banknotes were used or they were collected to be burned. And both of these images on the left and the center were taken in 1923. They kind of show us uh, that you know uh, financially. Uh, you know, things are looking grim for Germany uh, after the World War I, with woman using it to, you know, uh, to, to heat up her house, right? She's basically using them uh, to uh, light up her stove. Um, and, you know, historically, I will end there, perhaps. Historically, as we know, uh, to conclude this, crisis breeds extremism. So it will be these kinds of circumstances that Hitler, uh, that during which Hitler will start to refine his ideology, uh, will start to construct a German version of fascism, and be, will become politically active. And he will start to feel as if Germany was being treated too harshly after World War I, um, that foreign powers have interfered too much with Germany, and that the peace of Versailles uh, was actually an unfair deal for Germans. And he will kind of proclaim himself to be this crusader who will make things better for Germany in the face of the economic trouble. How will this happen? Well, you'll have to come back to see me um, in lecture two of this week. Uh, and I will be looking forward to seeing you there as you will learn about the Hitler's rise to power in the beginning of the World War II. Until then, have a wonderful rest of your day. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.